Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Energy City Plugged In Podcast, where we talk about the latest in news, sports, culture, and business in the Estevan area. The Energy City Plugged In Podcast is sponsored by Estevan Mercury Publications, Estevan's number one source for news since 1903. My name is David Wilberg, and I am the editor for Estevan Mercury Publications. Joining me this week is Brian Zinchuk, the editor of Pipeline News, Saskatchewan's monthly petroleum newspaper. Brian, it's always great to have you here to talk about the latest in the energy sector. It's good to be here. Of course, one of the big stories uh, the energy sector across the province at this time of year is... Uh, the wrap-up of winter drilling season. It's often been viewed as the peak time for drilling in the province, and it was fairly active this year, wasn't it, Brian? Uh, yes, it was. So March 15th is the traditional end of the winter drilling season. It's typically the start of spring breakup, give or take a day or two. Uh, so what that means is that large loads can't be uh, driven on most highways and most gravel roads, so therefore everyone basically has to wrap up their operations out in the field. Uh, this winter, we saw an average of about 72, give or take, rigs working throughout Saskatchewan. That's not just southeast, but that's all Saskatchewan. Uh, that's a uh, significant improvement over 2016. It's a slight improvement over 2017, but it's still 30% down compared to the boom years, uh, which ended in 2014. Which is probably to be expected. Yeah. So uh, the difference is, is that... Uh, I've spoken to a number of the uh, independent operators out here who do the drilling, the actual drilling companies. Mm -hmm. The rates they're getting are still substantially discounted from what they used to get. Uh, you know, there's, they're, they may be turning to the right, but they're not necessarily making much in the way of money or money to reinvest. They're keeping the doors open, they're keeping uh, people employed. Uh, there are more activity than there has been in the past couple of years, but it's still very much a tough slog. It is the oil differential that we that we hear about in a lot in the industry right now, isn't it? Uh, that the oil is, price differential. That's primarily something that uh, affects uh, Western Saskatchewan more than Eastern Saskatchewan because the differential you're referring to is largely the uh, differential between West Texas Intermediate, which is the North American mm -hmm. standard, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Western Canadian Select WCS, which is the bitumen heavy oil standard, which is uh, essentially what Lloyd Minster is. Uh, based on. So that uh, definitely hurts that area. Uh, in that region, we saw that Husky actually had four rigs working to the end of break breakup, which on mostly on their thermal projects, which is a, a good thing to see. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of other uh, heavy oil activity. Uh, Baytex had one rig working. Uh, rifle Shot was another one that was working in that area uh, near Macklin. But, you know, the bigger part is for the rest of Saskatchewan where you have medium oil and you have light oil, the activity level was not bad. Mm -hmm. how, how does it, uh, you mentioned earlier, you know, it's it's a slight improvement from last year. And of course, it's a very big improvement from two years ago. Just how big of an improvement is it from two years ago and how does it compare with last year? So in 2016, we saw numbers in the 50s and even dropping into the 40s. Uh, for the act, number of active drilling rigs. And uh, it started, you know, a little stronger after Christmas and then declined uh, substantially, whereas this year it started pretty strong in the first week after the, into the new year. And after that, it basically stayed flat through the entire season. So that's actually that's a good indicator because if it was falling off, that is negative, obviously. Uh, some people, I'm sure, would like to have seen more rigs going to work. However... Uh, I do believe that we were getting to the point where we had labor constraints where even if we did want to put another 10 rigs to work, we probably would not have had the uh, hands, the roughnecks, the Derek Man uh, drillers, to actually go out and do it. Is there a little more optimism out there I, than when we, than at this time a year ago? Or is it about the same? Compared to a year ago, the optimism level is definitely improved. I mean... Good. Uh, in November of 16, talk going to knock on doors was like going to talk to someone after a funeral. It was that bad. And early 17 felt very much like that. It was slightly improving. So the optimism level is there. I mean, the difference is that oil has come up from the 30s up to the 60s. The rates the service companies are getting is still being paid on rates established when it was in the 30s. Some companies have told me they've seen some improvement but not much, and no one's anywhere close 
to what they were making before. Uh, one thing that a few people mentioned to me in the last uh, two weeks is that the price of diesel has gone up 25% compared to the lower points. And some companies are eating it, some are putting in a fuel surcharge, some think that fuel surcharges are counterproductive with their clients. So that is uh, an underlying thing that most people may not be aware of, is that when price comes up the gas pumps, it also hits the people who are primarily running very big rigs, using a huge amount of fuel every day. Okay. Why is it, for those who aren't aware, why is it that winter is kind of the, the, the peak time for drilling seasons each year? Well, one of the things is that areas that are inaccessible or uh, too wet, and in the last year was pretty dry in southeast Saskatchewan. In fact, it was mm-hmm. incredibly dry. Of course. Uh, however, in the years after 2011, we had such ground moisture from the flood year that there are some areas you simply you couldn't get to if you wanted to because either the RMs wouldn't allow it mm-hmm. or because it just was uh, economically impractical because uh, when you're working on a soft lease, the prices for everything go up because it costs a lot more to move. It's just a lot more difficult. Uh, so it's when you can work on frozen ground where it's a rock hard, the, a lot of these difficulties disappear. It's a lot easier to push snow than to push mud. And, uh, you know, you're not getting stuck in ruts in the same way you might be. So that's why we've uh, largely become a winter drilling province in that our, uh, our rig count is about 30% higher in the peak time in uh, January and February than it would be in uh, August, for instance. Fair enough. And of course, now we're seeing spring road bands come into effect uh, across southeast Saskatchewan with the RMs and you know, government coming in, those will be coming in soon. So oil field companies will be shifting their attention elsewhere, won't they? So the production companies, the ones that are, you know, hauling oil from the batteries, they still have to do that through road band. They may have to do it through uh, smaller loads in their trucks and more mm-hmm. loads, actually. But for most of the patch, this is when things shut down. This is when some people take holidays. Uh, this is when all the annual maintenance is done mo- all uh, semis are done, all trailers are usually done at this time uh, for their safeties, and it's a time to get caught up. It's also when uh, a very large portion of a patch does its uh, recertifications for its different training programs, such as H2S Alive. So there's, you know, road bands aren't coming into effect, but there's still lots of different activities to be done at this time of year. Yeah, and it's a lot of time for people to get caught up on life as well. You know, uh, in northern Alberta, this is the fir- first uh, three months of the year is called the 100 Days of Hell. Now in Saskatchewan, it's more like 75 days, but uh, it's pre- some people are run pretty ragged, so they need a break. Uh, one of the things that uh, com- came up actually yesterday, uh, which was uh, March 14th, was that we had uh, Prime Minister Trudeau actually come to Regina to the Everest Steel mm-hmm. Plant. Now, I did a, a focus on that back you know, way back in October of 2009, which you can still find on our website. Uh, I was there in September, and the edition was October edition, and talking about the Everest steel plant. Now, yeah. What most people don't realize is that if you wreck your uh, car and it ends up going to the wrecker and it's done, it becomes pipe. Almost every crushed car in Western Canada ends up going to the Everest mill in Regina. It's chopped up. Uh, at you know uh, rail derailments, uh, car, you know potash cars that come off the rails, anything like that, mm-hmm. they all end up being pipe. Mm-hmm. They all get chopped up and poured into the uh, into the kettles, and they turn it and melt, remelt it, and you know add the alloys, whatnot, and mix it in, and create steel. Now Regina does create steel that's used for all sorts of purposes, but they also have a pipe mill attached to the steel mill, and that pipe mill is a large diameter pipe mill and plus they have a small diameter pipe mill Mm -hmm. so almost every pipeline that's been built in western canada since uh uh, interprovincial pipelines uh line two has been built with regina steel yeah and without that steel mill uh it would have to come from uh ontario or the united states or china or elsewhere yeah. So when we hear these pipeline debates, when we hear about Kinder Morgan, about Trans Canada, about Keystone XL, uh, it is fundamentally tied to the economy of Regina. There's a thousand workers and families that are supported mm-hmm. by the, that that steel mill. So uh, it was a big deal when uh, the Trump administration said they were going to bring in uh, tariffs on all foreign steel and aluminum. Of course. 
And I, now, if, if you sit beside the Kentucky Fried Chicken in Estevan on any given day, usually mid-afternoon, you may see a train going by, a manifest train of a mixed load, and you'll probably see about 10 rail cars covered in, uh, stacked about four high and about three wide of steel pipe coming hmm. out of Regina Evraz. Yeah. And that's going to the American Midwest. Where it's going, I don't know, but I have seen it happening ever since I moved here 10 years ago, hmm. or I guess nine years ago. So we export a lot of pipe to the United States. Uh, a lot of the pipe that is currently sitting on the ground in North Dakota for the uh, planned Keystone XL pipeline came out of Regina. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's not just these pipeline projects, but you know, there's pipelines being built all the time in the United States. Mm-hmm. And we need the ability to export our pipe to the U.S. We lose that due to uh, some sort of tariff, and we're going to be hurting really bad. Yeah. Now, Everest poured a huge amount of money in improving their pipe manufacturing facility recently. I think it was over $200 million. So that's a lot of investment into not just uh, their c- capacity, but into the community, into the people that are there. So having the prime minister come and speak to uh, the workers and talk about, uh, you know, supporting uh, this uh, the steel industry and by uh, its notion pipelines, it's an interesting development because the Trudeau government has put out mixed messages on pipelines, to say mm-hmm. the least. Of course. Uh, I mean, they, they effectively killed the uh, Northern Gateway Pipeline. Mm-hmm. Uh, they effectively killed the Energy East pipeline. Absolutely. Uh, they're okay with uh, Keystone XL, and they're actively supporting the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline, which will, if it does go ahead, uh, will be made primarily of Regina Steel. Yeah. So, and I guess we're going to see what's going to happen here. Uh, you know, the next topic is you know, what's been going on with uh, Alberta and BC regarding Kinder Morgan, but... You know, at least finally, the industry is seeing some support directly from the prime minister mm-hmm. backing us. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Brian. We'll go, we've got a little bit more political talk coming up in our, our next segment, including a little bit more on the prime minister's visit to Regina. Welcome back. Joining me for our second segment is Brian Zinchuk, the editor of Pipeline News, Saskatchewan's monthly petroleum newspaper. Brian, before the break, you were talking about Justin Trudeau's visit to Everaz in Regina, Everaz Steel in Regina, uh, earlier this week, and why that's important for the Saskatchewan oil patch. And, of course, pipelines are a big deal uh, right now. Absolutely. And... Right now, the pipeline politics that's been going on for the last decade is really coming to a head between British Columbia and Alberta. This is probably the largest dispute between two provinces we've seen since Quebec threatened to leave Confederation. Mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, people in Alberta and people in the Saskatchewan oil patch are done with BC. In fact, I wrote a column for my weekly column a few weeks ago about this. You can find it on the SFM Mercury website. I think it was words to the effect of... Uh, twisted sister. Twisted we're, sister, we're not going to take it anymore. We're not going to take it. And uh, we're seeing a remarkable thing happening in Alberta right now in that the new leader of the United Conservative Party, uh, Jason Kenney, has been talking for months about it is time to shut off the pipeline. And now the Alberta government under the NDP, Rachel Notley, has taken up that cause. So we have actually a universal uh, agreement in Alberta to cut off BC from its oil supply. Now, the National Post did a story a few weeks ago saying, oh, BC will be fine. They're on the coast. I was going to say, won't they just find oil from elsewhere? Yeah, the, and, and then they wrote a story yesterday that said, uh, a lot of people who know a lot more than us told us we were wrong. Hmm. And they uh, were pointed out that 80 to 90% of all fuel consumed in uh, BC comes through that pipeline at some point. So even if their you know, oil is not coming out of the refinery in Burnaby, the other oil that they are getting that's coming from the refinery in Washington State came from the pipeline that went from through BC to Washington State. Mm-hmm. So if that gets cut off, uh, they're in deep trouble. I mean, we're talking about this could be worse for the lower mainland than the oil embargo that hit the United States uh, after the Yom Kippur War. Mm-hmm. 
talking serious economic repercussions. I mean, if you shut off the oil, some people are saying, oh, gas is going to cost $2 a, a liter. It costs um, a lot more than that. Won't it? It, it doesn't matter if the gas station has run out. Mm-hmm. It can be $10 a liter. It can be $20 a liter. It can be $2 a liter. If the gas station has run dry, the gas station has run dry. Absolutely. And uh, the thing about, you know, BC being, you know, having a port, yeah, its port is set up for export, not mm-hmm. import. So you can't just magically make all this uh, oil and fuel appear mm-hmm. and all the refined products that come through that pipeline because the, the existing Kinder Morgan pipeline is a mixed-use pipeline. So, for instance, uh, the uh, aviation fuel that's used to uh, fuel up the 747s and 787s that landed at Vancouver International, that pipeline gets turned off. People aren't going to be flying out of Vancouver in a very short order. Mm-hmm. And you can't just magically replace that. It's not an easy thing to do. Mm-hmm. So Alberta and uh, with the support of many people in Saskatchewan, including former Premier Brad Wall, who uh, did a speech to uh, the, I believe it's the Chamber of Commerce of Calgary a couple of days ago, basically said, yeah, we're done. We have had it up to here with all your pipeline politics, all your hypocrisy, all your tweeting with your uh, plastic cell phones, wearing your synthetic clothing, driving your uh, gas cousin SUVs to the protests. You don't want our fuel? Uh, you don't want our pipeline? Fine. Live without it, period. Mm-hmm. And I can probably say that every person that I, uh, if I, if I walked into any oil patch business tomorrow and asked if they should shut off that pipeline, they'll say, damn rights. So I think that the uh, the earth muffins in British Columbia who have been fighting so hard against this pipeline may realize very soon that uh, their standard of living is going to go down the tubes when that, the existing pipeline gets turned off. Now, what does this do for national unity? It is horrible. Mm-hmm. It is absolutely horrible because we have two uh, of the strongest economies in, the pro- in Canada same culture. We're not talking English, French. We're talking same culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, going hammer and tongs at each other. This is not good for national unity. And, you know, where is the federal government in this? The federal government, uh, Trudeau in Regina yesterday said, you know, this pipeline is going to get built. Okay, then let's see it get built. Mm-hmm. As in, uh, the Alberta government is saying, you know, we're done. There's no more. Mm-hmm. Do you think it will get built? Yes, I think there's going to be a lot of yelling and screaming. Uh, I'm honestly, I'm curious to see what would happen if they actually did embargo it. And I, I wrote a column somewhere along these lines, and it turns out that my column echoed stuff that I didn't wasn't aware of, is that not only uh, is the threat here to shut off the oil going into uh, and f- uh, fueling the BC economy, but... Back in 1999, I worked on a pipeline called the Alliance Pipeline, Mm -hmm. and it ran from Fort St. John, British Columbia, all the way to Chicago. One of my old stomping grounds, Fort St. John. And that that pipeline, a 36-inch pipeline, uh, supplies a good chunk of American uh, Midwest, Mm -hmm. and a very large portion of it comes from northeastern BC. And and British Columbia is one of its biggest growth areas right now is natural gas. Mm -hmm. And they have huge, absolutely enormous world-class reserves there, which is why there were at one point 22 planned uh, liquid by natural gas plants for BC. But Mm -hmm. guess what? They haven't built any. There's there's one that's kind of on the go, but it's a tiny little thing. And the Patronus one was scared off, $36 billion investment into British Columbia. Well, I guess we're not going to build it because the government won't back us. So uh, they have no other outlet. It's alliance or nothing. Mm Mm-hmm. And what uh, Jason Kenney is saying, and it looks like the Alberta government may be taking him up on us, is, well, if you won't take our oil to ship through uh, Alberta, maybe we won't sh- allow you to ship your gas through Alberta. Or, sorry, BC won't allow Alberta oil to ship through it without some sort of cost extracted. Maybe the same goes for BC gas going the other direction. Mm-hmm. Again, national unity is going to take a serious uh, uh, hit if this happens. Yeah. So it's interesting times we're living in at this. A little closer to home, uh, Saskatchewan, we got two new leaders for our main political party, Scott Moe, Premier for the Saskatchewan Party, and uh, and Ryan Miley, the leader of the opposition for the NDP. Uh, what do the, what does these two leaders 
stances on the energy sector? Well, uh, I've actually sat down with both of them. Uh, the biggest differentiation between them is that Scott Moe says, hell no, there will be no carbon tax. Mm -hmm. Period. Done. End of story. I don't care what the federal government says, there will be no carbon tax. Mm -hmm. Which happens to be what Jason Kenney is saying next door, by the way, as well. He's Absolutely. Uh, whereas Ryan Miley is saying, yes, on a carbon tax. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also said that um, like a, the larger part of the energy industry is he wants to phase out coal by 2030. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what some people may be aware of is that uh, the coal and the uh, carbon dioxide sequestration actually has not only significant impact right now for the oil patch, but has potential for the next you know, generations. Mm -hmm. If we put carbon capture on the rest of the Boundary Dam, if we put it on Shand, uh, that uh, CO2 would be used potentially to add the life of the Bakken field in, uh, in the Stoughton area or the Steelman field for the next 30 years, 40 mm -hmm. years. That has tremendous impact. If you shut down the coal plants, uh, then that limits what you can do. Your tertiary enhanced oil recovery goes out the window. Yeah. So those are the biggest issues between them. Uh, I mean, what we're basically seeing right now here is that uh, while the, the rest of the team is the same, the captains have changed. So we've got two different, two different captains on the ice, and, uh, you know, this game is going to play a lot differently now. Mm -hmm. uh, Miley's already said, well, maybe it's time for an election right now. Yeah. Uh, we have fixed election dates in Saskatchewan. They're kind of sort of followed. But uh, I don't think the the Mo administration is going to uh, call it a re-election. I don't soon. think so either. I I think we've seen it in the past. Uh, the, the government wants to give themselves a little bit of time to get their policies in place, and the Mo team wants to have a, a balanced budget next year. And Absolutely. I think we're going to have to see that. The other thing that, and this is a little bit problematic, in that Mo is trying desperately to establish his stamp on his government. He's absolutely, which is understandable. He is coming out from the, under the shadow of what many people would call the greatest premier Saskatchewan's had in maybe a century. Mm -hmm. uh, people that didn't cheer for Tommy Douglas, obviously. Obviously. Uh, but the uh, so he's got to establish his own street cred, and the issue here is that. Uh, Generally speaking, most premiers, once they retire and they say they're done, they're done. Mm -hmm. And you don't hear from them again. You didn't hear from Lauren Calvert at all. Mm -hmm. uh, Roy Romano was asked to come back to, uh, by his own party to do a commission on health care. That was a little different. He did talk about health care, but he kind of stayed out of everything else. Uh, Brad Wall well, basically he's... went and talked to Calgary as if, and it's giving the same sort of speech, probably with more vigor because he doesn't have the the restrictions of being premier anymore. Mm -hmm. So the question is, who speaks for Saskatchewan now? Is it Scott Moe or is it Brad Wall? Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, legally it is uh, Scott Moe. But will anyone say to Brad Wall, well, you know, you've had your time? <laughs> probably not. Probably not. So the, the other question I thought after he did this speech in Calgary is, that sure sounds like someone who wants to run federally, who someone who said he's never going to run mm -hmm. federally. Mm -hmm. Has he changed his mind when he grew his beard? It'll be interesting to see. Thanks again, Brian. Uh, coming back uh, after the break, we'll have uh, Brian back for our final segment. Welcome back for our final segment. Joining me once again is Brian Zinchuk, the editor of Pipeline News, Saskatchewan's monthly petroleum newspaper. Brian, I know you've been working on a trucking theme for next month's edition of Pipeline. How's the general mood in the uh, trucking industry? Well, it's not as happy as I would have hoped. Uh, I mean, companies are working, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, I've talked to a number of the largest firms in southeast Saskatchewan, and not one of them has bought a new truck. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked Which isn't a good sign. Not for three years. Mm -hmm. I realize that these are fleets of 50, 60 or more units and everything's putting miles on it. Everything has a, uh, a time when they need to be replaced and when numerous fleets are not being replaced, that's, that's saying something about the industry and nor are they planning on buying anything new anytime soon either because they simply aren't getting the money for that. Uh, we talked earlier about the price of diesel, that's impacting them as well, but 
on the other side, you know, they have hired a little bit. Mm-hmm. So that's an improvement. That's good yeah. to hear. Uh, the other thing about uh, the trucking theme here is that uh, uh, Kenworth is actually uh, opening up a new shop in, uh, or, or sorry, a replacement shop in Estevan. So they will be moving to a new facility on Shan Road that is substantially larger than its previous facility. And uh, that is a uh, definitely a good sign. Uh, when a company is willing to invest that sort of money into the economy here because probably 85% of their trucks sold in Southeast Saskatchewan are for the oil patch. And a lot of the fleets that I've spoken to actually recently are Kenworth fleets. So they're obviously showing some faith that things are going to pick up. I seem to remember, I think that that shop for Kenworth opened just after I moved here in 2001, just... Uh, on the east end of town, so I remember that well. It does it? It just seems like yesterday. Well, it's they were opening. You know, being that they uh, uh, they lived through the boom in that shop, crammed like sardines and going hard. Uh, you know, this new facility that they're going to have is uh, will be a, a market improvement, and they'll have much, much more uh, space for the yard than they had before. So, uh, also much better highway access as well, paved access and just off the truck bypass. So it's going to be a, a great new facility for them. Uh, this facility was empty for several years because it used to be the Millennium Stimulation Facility. They built okay. it, and uh, they went out of business, and it sat vacant. So we're seeing that uh, come back to life, and that's always a good sign. Good. And uh, one last thing that we want to quickly discuss is the upcoming Estevan Oilfield Technical Society bond spills. I know it's one of my favorite events of the year, and I know you enjoy it each year as well. It's uh, March 23rd and 24th at the Power Dodge Curling Center in Estevan, and it's always a great time, isn't it? The uh, the bond spiel it very much is kind of the party at the end of uh, the winter season. So we were talking earlier about how this is the wrap-up. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's bond spiels throughout the region in uh, you know, January, February, March, but the big party has always been asked fan. Now, this party is not as big as it used to be. It's I remember when it was an 80-team bond spiel when I first moved here over five days. Yeah, four or five days. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it, it was a pretty big hoot and nanny. This year, it's only 32 teams. It's only two days. So it is a reduction. Uh, part of that is a reduction in the interest in curling. Mm-hmm. Part of that is a reduction in the money to spend on these sort of things and for people to be able to take the time to do this. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully we'll see this come back. Uh, Weyburn, for instance, this year had a bond spiel, whereas last year they canceled it. <laughs> you know, they were going something like 60 years and they canceled their bond spiel. So uh, they're back this year. Estevan is still going. Uh, I take those as good signs. How many teams was Weyburn this year? Oh, I think it was 24, but don't know. Well, that, that. That's encouraging because that's what it was for a while when I was – Doing sports for Wavering this week, it was you know kind of in that twenty four to thirty two team range. So it's, if they're back I, up to twenty four, that's a good sign. I, I think so, but I'm not certain. About okay, that. Yeah, and it's it's always a fun weekend down at the curling club. It's a great, obviously, it's a great networking opportunity uh, to be able to have uh, an event like that, and it's you know the curlers get to have a have a good time. Uh, so that again, that and you know you'll be down there taking pictures. Uh, as usual. As yeah. usual, and our uh, sports reporter, Corey Atkinson, will be down there doing uh, his job as well. And uh, you can look forward to seeing a uh, a uh, Welcome to welcome Curlers spe- special section in next week's edition of the Estevan Mercury. Well, Brian, thank you very much for joining me this week. It's always a pleasure to have you in here to talk about the latest in the energy sector in Saskatchewan. So thanks again, Brian. I want to thank our uh, producer, Will Acri, for uh, his work in making this podcast possible. And I want to thank uh, all of you for tuning in this week. Until I, next time, I'm David Wilberg, the editor for Estevan Mercury Publications.